Uh, yes, welcome. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to celebrate Tejendra's work over many, many years. Uh, I've been there a number of us in the room who work in the area of education and international development, what Tejendra has done. However, as he's also brought us into a space where we can discuss peace and conflict studies in the context of education and development. Uh, his work is really most important, and he has created, uh, I should say, a really important space, not just for himself, but for us at UCL, and in particular, the group C, the Center for Education and International Development, uh, comes to say here. Yeah, we, of course, we are in the faculty of law right now, but uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here nonetheless. Um, I had a chance to speak with Jennifer just um, earlier today about his work. He was telling me about it. Of course, I knew about his interest in the political economy of education and development. But he spelled out for me the uh, rubric, let's say, that he's used as a way of trying to understand how education, conflict, and development come together. Because VPLP, the institution, where education, educational institutions can play the role of victim, perpetrator, liberator, and peace builder, and more. And this also made me think about my interest in education in conflict areas over many years, initially in Bosnia and Croatia, um, later work in Lebanon, and also more recently in Ukraine, where it's very clear that both the content of education and educational institutions themselves are at really on, on, on the front lines, literally on the front lines, and this is a major battlefront for us in the struggle for ideas, for democracy, for freedom, freedom and liberty. And it seems to me it's very clear that if we are going to move to the point where educational institutions can serve as forces for liberation and peace building, then we really do need to talk about the economy. We're very fortunate today that we are also graced by His Excellency Gamchandra Hajara. Forgive me if I mispronounced your name. I'll try again. Um, our colleague, Professor Elaine Unterhalter, will be chairing an important panel where colleagues from SOAS, Professor Michael Hutt, and from Sussex, Professor Mario Novelli, and our own Dr. Kumar will be discussing Jeremy's work. And it's really a wonderful way to kick off the year. I'm delighted to be here. How I wish you many congratulations. Thanks very much, Brad. So can I invite the panelists, including to Jennifer, to come up and sit here. So I think I'm going to add my very warm welcome to Brad. I also want, uh, as one of the co-directors of SEED, the Centre for Education and International Development, and so this, um, this book is a really important um, initiative for us in SEED, partly because it is, should I have started? No, is, it, is it okay? No, yeah. yeah. Um, the book is such an important initiative for us for SEED. Um, Brad sketched the big ideas, but um, it also is a celebration of the hard work, the creativity, the collaborative um, ethos that Tejendra has built around his contribution to us in SEED in Center for Education and International Development, the pioneering work he's done in establishing an, an MA, and the uh, really innovative um, theoretical, conceptual, and detailed um, uh, descriptive work that he's done working uh, not only in Nepal, but in a number of countries where conflict mars the education system. So it's wonderful to hear from Tejendra and this distinguished panel commenting 
on his work. So the way we're going to organize it is, uh, tonight is Tajendra is going to first talk to us for um, uh, a short while, but a short, long while, <laughs> about to give us some of the key inspirations about the book and uh, give more depth than just the wonderful cover and the fact that the book exists. And then we'll have uh, the three panelists and I'll introduce each one of them in turn. So now passing to you, to Jendra. Thank you. Oh, shall I introduce you or do you not need any more introduction? Um, uh, I've said maybe, I've said something about Tajendra's work um, and its significance. Uh, I think many of you know what a wonderful teacher he is. Many of you have read his excellent works of scholarship, his contribution to collaborative research projects, um, in oh, the, the significant one in Lebanon that uh, he, he's done with uh, our colleague Elaine Chase and Diana Lauriard, who's here, and um, the wonderful work he's done with Mario Novelli. So Tajendra is wide-ranging in, uh, in, in his interests, wonderful as a collaborative colleague, and a lovely writer, as you're going to hear now. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Elaine. <laughs> that was quite overwhelming introduction. Well, I haven't heard that length of introduction from you, so it was amazing to, to, to hear. And thank you for, for recognizing the work that, uh, that I've been doing. Um, I am uh, absolutely delighted uh, to um, have the presence of His Excellency um, Ambassador Ganchandra Acharya. Thank you so for uh, coming to UCL and attending this event. Uh, it really means a lot uh, in support of the work that I am doing, but also support of the uh, work on Nepal, which is, which is quite, quite significant. Um, thank you so much, panelists, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, who have found the time to read my book uh, and uh, um, I don't know how they found. I'm nervously waiting for their critical commentary on it. Uh, so I'm hoping that they will be nice and kind, but look forward to learning from uh, what they have to say. Uh, but also thank you so much everyone for coming to this event um, and family uh, and uh, everybody else. So what I'm planning to do is to talk a little bit about the journey of the book. Uh, so uh, I guess everyone has a story to tell about uh, how they wrote the book. Um, I haven't written many books like Mike has, of course, on Nepal. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a different kind of uh, presentation, I thought. And I was thinking about how do I introduce my book? rather than introducing a paper or a you know, research presentation or something. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that background and then um, um, say a little bit about what I uh, have argued in the book uh, and, uh, uh, and then basically conclude and hand over to, um, back to Elaine and then colleagues to comment on it and hopefully this will be an interesting discussion afterwards. Um, that's, the, that's the plan. Um, so, uh, as uh, I am uh, originally from Nepal, um, uh, obviously at the time when the Maoist insurgency uh, was um, quite severe during late 1990s and early 2000s, um, and uh, a lot of my um, relatives, distance relatives, um, who were working in the police and the, and the army, uh, and also some of them actually uh, were, you know, joining the Maoist rebellion. Um, so while during that time, as many Nepali, fellow Nepalis would know, that it was a very tense environment, uh, and schools across the country were coming under attack by both uh, the Maoists as well as the security forces. Um, and uh, every day we used to see the reports of uh, schools being um, destroyed, textbooks being uh, burnt down, um, you know, young students being kidnapped and taken to the forests for 
uh, political ed education, um, and, uh, and students and teachers being stopped on the way to school uh, for um, uh, you know, suspicion of their collusion with the rebels, um, and a lot of tense uh, environments that everybody in the education sector were, were experiencing. So I wanted to kind of investigate the impact of armed conflict on, on education. Uh, and uh, that is the reason why I started my PhD to look at, okay, how is conflict impacting on teachers, students, uh, and educational processes in, in general. And then when I began my PhD, then I was introduced to interesting literature around uh, how education is not necessarily a positive uh, um, uh, phenomenon, that it can also contribute to produce conditions for uh, violent conflict. For example, the work uh, that Mario has done and other scholars, I was introduced to those and uh, I began to look at how Nepal's educational development might have contributed to create and uh, exacerbate those conditions of conflict. And I ended up writing my PhD thesis talking a lot about how education was actually creating conflict rather than talking about how conflict had impacted on education. Of course, there is a lot that I've discussed on, on that as well. So that was the kind of the, the, the beginning. And then later on, I got involved in a number of research projects looking into um, the role of education in conflict transformation and addressing socioeconomic uh, disparities, uh, challenges around access to education, um, quality of learning, um, you know, the role of teachers, teacher professional development. So those kinds of issues were quite prominent. A lot of international organizations were involved in collaboration with the Nepalese government and uh, civil society organizations in supporting in post um, um, sort of uh, accord period after 2006. Um, those projects were also the inspirations to think about the ideas uh, and learning um, as part of this, uh, this book. Um, then also as part of my sort of professional work, academic work within UCL, um, uh, I worked on education, conflict and peace module and working with the uh, brilliant students coming from around the world uh, was absolutely inspirational and that also sort of motivated and, and now as uh, Elaine uh, mentioned the master's program um, that began with the, from the scratch and now a full master's program on conflict emergencies and peace um, was another inspiration to uh, really um, do this book. Um, and also over the past six, seven years, I've been uh, working with other colleagues uh, to run um, seminar series on conflict and emergencies. And we've invited probably around 30 scholars from around the world uh, to speak at that um, uh, seminar. Uh, most of the, the events are actually online available. And those discussions were also quite rich and uh, and, and inspirational and which actually fed into the development of this body of work within the Institute of Education uh, in which this book is I guess is a part. Um, so um, what is this book about? Um, as every author would say that if you want to find out about my book you have to buy it and read. Um, <laughs> but I can't really say that now because it's hugely expensive but hopefully the paperback <laughs> will be available and, uh, and uh, many of uh, you would have um, sort of would be able to, to, to access it more easily. Uh, of course through the institution it is available to, to read. Um, but I'm going to just quickly lay out what this contributes. It, it, I hope that it contributes to the scholarship in the field of um, education and conflict, which is an, uh, in a rapidly growing field, uh, which actually brings education and conflict together to try to understand um, how education can promote uh, peace, social transformation, social justice, equality, just um, equity, and, and, and so forth. So I begin the discussion in the book uh, with, the, with broad sort of debates in the field of education and conflict, and then look into the case of uh, Nepal, trying to draw upon this uh, 
Maoist insurgency and its uh, um, interaction with uh, education. And then I try to sort of uh, do some theoretical abstraction and try to, to present uh, some basic um, uh, analytical or theoretical frameworks, I would, I would call it. They're, they're not necessarily uh, hugely groundbreaking, but I, I, I think they're useful in uh, sort of in, in the field of international development to try to use them to understand that, that interaction. So I try to demonstrate how social, historical injustices in formal education contributed to the narrative of uh, armed rebellion um, in Nepal. Um, and some of the examples that um, I discuss and, and uh, quite with a lot of uh, rich data uh, is about how unequal educational access across different castes, ethnicities, gender and different geographical regions contributed to exacerbate those historical inequalities. In other words, um, you know, many sort of subordinate castes, if you like, or marginalized ethnic groups were not able to benefit from the educational development and were not able to participate in economic and political and social uh, spheres equitably, which actually gave um, uh, a narrative, develop a narrative of grievances which fueled, um, uh, you know, armed um, sort of uh, this ideological um, uh, conflict. And also there were disparities in educational outcomes and, uh, you know, high caste um, uh, communities advancing uh, comparatively more as compared to those who are uh, representing more, uh, you know, marginalized and low caste communities. There's also a historical process of cultural assimilation around the dominant Nepali language and also some of the hegemonic ideas that represented the, the, the ruling, ruling class or the elite um, social groups where uh, in a country which was hugely diverse ethnically, geographically and culturally and linguistically, um, the promotion of one language, one culture and one form of national identity fueled those grievances among those populations who were actually organized uh, sort of under this uh, narrative of uh, resistance against the hegemony of the political state. Um, and then I also show how the Maoist insurgency and the conflict impacted on teachers and students and more generally on education. So what are the key arguments in the, in the book? So one of the things I, I would uh, argue that is useful to try to think in other contexts beyond Nepal is that Teachers have an enormous responsibility of child protection uh, in conflict settings. I think this is, uh, a, a, you know, a reasonably under-researched area. I think that the scale and the severity of responsibility expected of teachers uh, in protecting children who have been trusted by parents when they they are sent to schools is quite significant. I mean, I'm just I work in other contexts. Um, I mean, I was thinking about, for example, Nigeria where schools are constantly under um, attack by Boko Haram uh, militants. And when parents are sending their children to school, they put so much responsibility on teachers for, for protection. And teachers themselves feel insecure in those circumstances um, and at the same time are expected to protect those, those children where, you know, from the armed groups, you can imagine. So that severity, the, 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 the tension and, and nervousness um, is quite uh, extraordinary. And I think a lot of research is, is needed in that, in that area, which I talk about a little bit in the, in the book. The second point is about... Um, so there's a global campaign for access to education um, uh, and, and maintaining education during conflict, right? And when there are uh, the enormous amount of risks of attack on schools during conflict, um, it is probably better to temporarily close the schools rather than pushing for continuing education in those circumstances. And what we saw during COVID-19 is another form of emergency where 
schools had to be closed to uh, prevent the spread of uh, virus and to, to, to save, save lives. Um, schools also served as significant spaces for political socialization during Maoist conflict. Um, and uh, most of the development literature talks about um, how teachers and students are victimized during uh, violent conflicts. But what comes from this research is about teachers and students who were well informed uh, political actors in, you know, in Maoist, Maoist rebellion. So there were many teachers and students who were, uh, who were actually uh, well aware of the, uh, the need for social transformation, political um, change in order to provide those rights and equity and justice to the historically most marginalized population. So um, there was that political activism within the education um, you know, spheres as well. Um, and what has happened recently, uh, you know, after the Maoist insurgency and the subsequent uh, 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 ethnic uprisings in the southern part of the country, is that the historical um, hill, high, bay, uh, high caste, male dominated socio political structures have been significantly um, ruptured. And the voices of the historically marginalized populations um, has come to the forefront, and as it is seen in the political. Uh, outcomes in the recent um, elections um, and it's a, such a coincidence that the the Maoist um, commander <laughs> has become the prime minister you know I think he became prime minister a couple of weeks ago it's quite a kind of uh, a coincidence that uh, that we're talking about uh, uh, Maoist insurgency now uh, also one of the conclusions that uh, I draw from this if education has to contribute to wider uh, you know, sort of peace building and social transformation, then it, it needs to be reconceptualized in the sense that equity and justice need to be at the heart of educational systems. Unfortunately, most conflict affected countries, you know, the post conflict settings, tend to go back to sort of business as usual. And in, I think in Nepal as well. Um, there's no significant change in the education system and I think those existing old mindsets, approaches and uh, 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 you know, paradigms continue to govern and as a result I think the uh, expectations of those uh, movements in the, in the past have not been sufficiently addressed through, edu through education. Um, and I think finally I would say that the constitution of Nepal 2015 is probably the most significant uh, outcome of the historical movements that have taken place um, uh, in, in Nepal and uh, it certainly provides the opportunity and possibilities for those changes which were imagined by people's um, um, struggles uh, which are about uh, uh, autonomy, respect for diversity, inclusion uh, and also empowerment of the most marginalized um, uh, communities which is yet to be seen. Um, and I try to develop a, a, a simple framework for, of analysis which is called VPLP and many of my students actually like it which is nice to see um, where education is conceptualized um, as, a, as a victim, as a perpetrator where it can create and fuel those conditions of conflict uh, but also it can facilitate that uh, process of liberation by providing critical consciousness about socio-economic conditions that they live in and they can organize and uh, uh, fight for justice and social, social change. But of course, most significantly, uh, education can contribute to uh, broader uh, peace building by supporting processes of uh, um, you know, sustain sustainable peace, but also preventing violent conflict by addressing those drivers which I was discussing earlier. Uh, as Brad was also talking about earlier, is I think the political economy, how power and resources are distributed across different social cultural groups and how those relationships are formed and how those relationships um, are sustained or transformed over a period of time is very important and education is implicated quite significantly uh, in those discussions and which is something that I try to develop uh, at the end of the end of the book. <laughs>
So I just want to thank you so much for being here. And uh, I think um, um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is uh, that is family, as you would always um, mention. And uh, and I think uh, it's also a way of uh, trying to impress my son, who didn't think that achieving a PhD was a significant thing uh, in life. And this is another attempt to to try and <laughs> impress him. <laughs> um, but also, yeah, thank you. And, and also, of course, uh, Brad, for your enormous support for making this project possible. And I'm most grateful. And all the colleagues in my department in SEED, uh, it's you know, great to work together. And also all the colleagues who write in this area that I have benefited from. Thank you. Thank you very much to Chandra for that excellent uh, taster of so many of the interesting themes in the book, its history and the way that it's charting um, uh, paths forward through education and international development. With uh, Leila Kadawal, who's here tonight, I've been writing about the history of education and international development at the Institute of Education. And it's a history that's kind of mired in um, uh, many streams of colonialism and trying to change it. And it's such a refreshing taste of how different things can be to, to hear to Gendra's uh, personal reflection on his book and thinking about where to go forward. But now it's over to the critics and we want to hear a range of different perspectives. I'm going to um, pass to Dr. Uma Pradhan, who's um, our colleague at uh, INSEED, but with uh, a PhD um, from Oxford on language ed uh, education and N Nepali nation, and lots of um, uh, wonderful achievements in terms of her own distinguished writing. So very much looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you very much, Elaine, for that introduction. And thank you so much, uh, Tejinderji, for inviting me to comment on your book. Um, I've been very much inspired by your research throughout my research career. So uh, very much honored to be uh, invited to read and comment and join this distinguished panel to comment on your book today. Um, I've structured my comments uh, mainly around three broad contributions to education studies and maybe uh, ask uh, two questions towards the end and I'll try to uh, keep within the 10 minutes that's been allocated to me. Um, first of all, I think uh, one of the main, um, uh, main contributions of the book is that the book has done a very wonderful job of bringing uh, the social and political context uh, to contribute to the broader understanding of education, education and just generally education studies. Uh, book addresses the specificity of Nepali um, uh, Maoist conflict and bring this brings this into uh, con this conflict uh, perspective into uh, the broader scholarship of education, especially by uh, paying attention to politics of education. And you've discussed the difference between education politics and politics of education quite a lot in detail which is quite quite a wonderful discussion in your in your book um, during the Maoist conflict uh, schools and education institutions in Nepal were uh, one of the primary victims uh, the primary targets of violence regardless of whether they were state institutions or whether they were uh, uh, public uh, uh, state schools or whether they were private schools um, State schools were attacked because they were seen as uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the symbol of the state, because it was seen as a state institutions and symbols of, a symbol of a state, and it was seen as a space that uh, perpetuated this particular version of Nepali nationalism, uh, language, and state ideology. And teachers became targets of violence, uh, as they were seen as the agents of 
the state. And at the same time, uh, uh, security personnel would also arrest teachers and students as they were suspective, uh, suspected as being Maoist activists as well. So they were being attacked from different uh, groups uh, for, for, for different very contradictory uh, accusations. And secondly, in the case of uh, private schools, uh, these schools were seen as class enemies by Maoist uh, groups, in which case there were extortions, there were donations, asked, there were pressures uh, to close down these private institutions. So uh, schools, regardless of their type, whether they were state schools or whether they were private schools, uh, they were impacted by conflict uh, in different ways. And uh, the book clearly shows that they were being attacked. Uh, many schools were destroyed. Others uh, suffered various kinds of bomb explosion. And many were caught in crossfire between rebels and uh, security forces by in, in different ways. So book clearly, uh, very clearly broadens this field of um, education studies by focusing on this um, education as an area that is not merely for human capital development, but also deeply implicated in these social and political uh, context. And uh, by expanding this kind of view on education, um, which is uh, which is very much integral part of political economy of education, as, as you mentioned in your book, uh, by looking at the relationship between various power resources and markets, etc. Um, so so uh, I, I really appreciated the way you have uh, uh, differentiated between education politics and politics of education and then really called for a serious uh, commitment, you know, how it also brings out these contradictions in, in education and conflict very well. Uh, there are several examples throughout the book um, uh, where students were uh, caught in conflict as direct and indirect victims, abducted, uh, forced to join the conflict. But at the same time, there were uh, examples where students chose to participate as Maoist cadres, where pupils, uh, they, were, they, they were not merely um, the passive victims, as you mentioned, uh, but also influential political agents uh, in this struggle, and were, in a way, provided uh, some, source, so, uh, some sort of opportunities for their children as well, uh, who were willing to um, join mainly because they were also uh, able to obtain things like uh, exposure, training, education, uh, and some kind of sense of purpose as well. So it's it's quite uh, quite an interesting uh, contradiction in that way that the, the various ways in which uh, uh, education and conflict may come together uh, in 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 this, especially in the the way it, we can see it in the context of Nepal. Um, again, similar. Clearly, teachers were uh, also participants in this political conflict, um, as well as the victims of the conflict. And uh, the book has also identified how um, uh, uh, education uh, inequality has been one of the key causes for education. But as at the same time, very highly educated uh, uh, people of Nepal were the leaders of this uh, conflict as well. So, so in, in a way, whether uh, the, uh, to, to what extent education inequality or the acquisition of education are uh, really uh, leading to Maoist conflict. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, so, so Book has done in, uh, so uh, really excellent job in highlighting this kind of complex positioning of schools, complex positioning of education, which often reveals these uh, apparently ideologically uh, contradictory responses to conflict um, uh, by their stakeholders. And, uh, and as you mentioned in your book, who were simultaneously complying, enterprising, resisting, and sometimes very ambivalent to the way they were uh, engaging with the conflict. Um, and thirdly, the book also provides a very hopeful view of education, where change is possible within the field of education, uh, within through education institutions and through education, where education can serve as, um, as, as a vehicle to institutionalize and strengthen the transformative policies um, aimed at building sustainable uh, peace. And um, uh, you, you've identified 
and uh, immediate uh, conflict responses such as schools um, as zone of peace campaigns uh, that created uh, pressures on warring parties to keep education institutions outside um, um, the, these kind of uh, conflict act activities and at the same time um, it also identifies the need to create these kind of new discourses of nation building uh, that could create feelings of injustice uh, that could address the feelings of injustice uh, felt by different groups so as you've noted in your book um, education uh, you've seen uh, like it has a key role in in dealing with the past by looking at these uh, uh, different processes of history making the present by recovering from the legacies of uh, conflict and the future uh, by contributing to reconciliation and peace so one of the important contribution i think of the book lies in this identifying education as this important arena of building sustainable peace as well and it is in this context um, uh, that i have a, a question as well and uh, the 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 books uh, what i noted was the book's main uh, focus was on this kind of spectacular or very this visible uh, violence um, and while you uh, the book uh, traces the roots of these spectacular violence or or maoist conflict in the structural inequality and the long term chronic uh, problems of education in nepal we are yet to find effective ways to deal with these uh, these uh, 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 these issues and address these kind of more structural issues in education and um, uh, conflict in this uh, multi-ethnic, uh, very heterogeneous context like Nepal um, uh, is 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 a result of you know something that has taken place gradually over a period of time. And as you pointed out, uh, you know uh, decentralization can be, for example, <laughs> strategies like decentralization and devolution of educational authority can. be strategically used uh, while maintaining control over more structural aspects of education um, like national curriculum and uh, language of instruction and the recent like more recent um, studies emerging from nepal and uh, to some extent my my work as well uh, shows that incorporating minority language education is is quite a challenge uh, when it comes to really doing it in practice due to various issues of language hierarchy um, and uh, uh, lack of resource courses um you uh, know girls education program which was intended to address uh, um educational gender gender inequality in education have led to very contradictory results where uh, we can see uh, girls more girls in government schools uh, uh, but while uh, boys are being enrolled in more sought after uh, private schools so the it is really um and 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 in terms of like for example there are uh, scholarships for dalit and indigenous groups which are very small but when it becomes substantial um uh, uh, uh they are usually taken over by high caste groups who are able to better navigate the bureaucratic systems so despite some of these shifts in uh, in 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 uh, policies the lived experiences of the learners um are quite dominated by uh, these various levels of inequality and 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 i wonder in this context Um, of nepal do you see any kind of positive lessons uh, on transformative uh, policy practice emerging from nepal uh, that might contribute to education studies in general uh, or broader educational practice and uh, second question is related the book also you know talk you talk about ch children and teachers as victims and sometimes as active agents of conflict again focusing on these guys spectacular aspects of conflict and i wondered if there were any any local or everyday uh, responses or negotiations that you you were able to see during your uh, your research and what are the if there are any kind of subtle ways in which people might have resisted or challenged these uh, things that they they were facing um during conflict um um i think i'll stop there and thank you very much for this opportunity to read and comment on your book and thanks so much again very much Emma for uh, noting the historical uh, sweep of the book and raising some of these questions about complexity and contradiction and I, I, uh, are you lucky that to change because we'll be sitting there off your your sheet um
Our, our, our next um, speaker is Professor Michael Hutt. He is, I learned from the web, the only professor of Nepali and Himalayan studies in the UK and taught at SOAS and I hope we'll be able to give us an extensive um, setting for okay. his comments on the book. But welcome, I'm looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, again, like like Umaji, um, very many thanks for the for the invitation to to first read this book and to come and, and share share some thoughts on it. Um, I must also add my congratulations on a most impressive contribution to an on, ongoing international debate debate on on conflict and, and education. Um, I don't know if, how many of you know this, but across the UK higher education system, the, there is a smattering of us um, who, who work on Nepal. Uh, and we all know each other pretty well. We, we, in fact, we gather together every year for a, a couple of days in a different university and share our research and so on. Um, and an increasing number of us are Nepali uh, as well, um, which is a, a, new, a new trend um, in, in, of recent years. So uh, we, we are colleagues and we are friends and we meet very regularly. And I think it's, it's very heartening uh, for us to see somebody like Tejendra Ji um, bringing Nepal material uh, and bringing it into a wider, a wider context, a wider debate. Um, I, I actually took early retirement from SOAS two years ago, but I can st say all through my years of uh, supervising uh, graduate students particularly, one of the things I often said to them was, okay, that's, that's really very interesting, your know, dissertation, your essay for us who are interested in Nepal. But what's it an example of, you know, in the broader, broader world? Make it interesting for somebody who doesn't know where Nepal is or why they should be interested in Nepal. And I think Chajendra has done that in, in very full measure. Uh, this is a book I hope that will be read by people who don't necessarily read books about Nepal, but are interested in the topic and, and then will learn from the context. Um, and I think that's a, a major, major achievement. Um, I liked very much many things about this book. I, I like the way also that you set it out, you set out your own, I hate that word positionality. I think it's position. So you set out your own position very nicely at the beginning, um, where you talked about yourself and also your father, which is a very Nepali thing to do. And I was very, very, very charmed by it. Um, uh, and you write very poignantly that modern education has completely uprooted us, I think referring to your own generation of sort of internationalized Nepalis, uprooted us from their origins with only nostalgia and residue. Um, I found that very poignant. And the book as a whole, and particularly the sort of core chapters, uh, bring, us, bring the reader face to face very, very dramatically and very directly with the realities of being a school teacher, of being a school student, through a, through a time of enormous uh, difficulty and conflict and violence um, in a very direct way. I mean, the letter you reproduced on, I think, page 91, uh, sent to a head teacher by the Maoists. Um, we received your letter. Are you always drunk? Um, why do you force us to be cruel? Uh, you're, there are rumors that you collected the money and embezzled in funds. What is going on? You better explain. The, the, the chilling, threatening, mocking tone of that letter is, is, is very real. Um, I also very much appreciated your research methods um, in the way in which you actually got 240 students to, to produce text, to produce a narrative about their experience um, on which you based, from which you quote quite extensively. And again, that authenticity, that directness of that experience re you reproduce in the page, I think is very, very compelling. Um, you talk about some of these, the stories um, being very uh, revealing that some children were very well informed about the rationale of the, of the Maoist rebellion. And this is where I, I have to make one criticism of your book, um, which will not be surprising to you, or to Umaji coming from me, um, but it's um, that you don't pay, I think, quite enough attention to Nepali language sources. So, uh, I mean, one example of, of a publication that would be relevant here is, is, the, is the memoir of Tara Rai, which I'm sure you're aware of, the um, So it was a diary of a 13-year-old of a girl who left school and joined the Maoists and talks about her ideological orientation and learning and her experience at the hands of the security forces that arrested her, um, which I think you know, could have 
be interestingly referenced. Uh, I mean, I, I understand the, the, the narratives you gathered are very direct and very, very authentic and so on, but there, there are other, other ones there too. Um, so I'd like to just make a couple of more reflective comments, uh, slightly more length, about some of the issues that arise from the book. Um, and the first, I think, is the one that's been touched upon by everybody so far, which is this relationship between the level of, ed of development and educational provision in Nepal and the, the eruption of the Maoist rebellion in, in the 1990s. And as I, as I was reading this book, I, I was remembering um, a conference I convened myself at SOAS in uh, November 2001. Um, we, Nepal scholars from the UK, France and the USA, if I remember correctly, and uh, quite a large group of, of uh, journalists and academics that we invited from Nepal, spent two rooms, two days locked in a room um, <coughs> presenting papers and discussing what was this rebellion, why was it happening, where was it coming from. Um, and we came up with some, some ideas and some, 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 some preliminary sort of conclusions. Many of us linked it to poverty, oppression, marginalization, particularly among the, the indigenous Tanadati uh, populations. Um, and clearly these were, these were factors. But uh, also um, as, as time has moved on, um, I think it's become increasingly clear that the, the rebellion was also the product of a very particular set of circumstances and a very particular moment. Um, in, in the history of Nepal, a kind of tipping point, perhaps between the relationship, uh, in the relationship between educational attainment and frustrated aspiration on, on the one hand, um, particularly among people of marginal communities. And this coincided with a shift in the political configuration as multi-party democracy was re-established. In the, in the early 1990s, and then the emergence of a new political leadership. So there's a strange contradiction here, which the book examines in quite some detail, um, and it's surely not unique to Nepal. There's a contradiction of a rebellion against marginalization and underdevelopment, or the conditions that create those, con those, those predicaments, um, and that rebellion not taking place until education and development have reached a certain point at which the young people at the, the front of this rebellion become sufficiently uncomfortably aware of their own marginalization or, or something, something like that. Um, and this is, this is work I think that, that's of huge value, not just to Nepal, but, but, but across all kinds of places uh, with, in conflict and with education. Um, other, other people that have worked on that, this uh, Ina Zhakovic has worked on, on literacy practices among the Maoists, which I think would, would be relevant here. Um, and I think it's w also worth saying that um, there's hardly a Nepali politician who hasn't read Gorky's mother novel. There's hardly a Maoist rebel who hasn't read Chamkilo Rato Tara, which is the Nepali translation of a, a, a Maoist Chinese book, Bright, Bright Reg Star. So I think that, that out of school schooling, ideological schooling, um, is something that perhaps uh, could have been, more could have been said about, about that. Um, I think I probably said nearly enough, but just to say one more thing. A question that we sometimes ask ourselves um, is, if that was that moment, uh, uh, the, the marginalization of these communities is, is, is still, you know, it's still there, it's still a factor to some extent. So is another, political rebellion likely in Nepal any time conceivably? The answer to this seems to be broadly no. Um, and the reasons for this are very many. And on, on the one hand, one could say, Ambassador, I don't know if you will agree with me, mm -hmm. but the, you could say that many of the Maoist demands have actually been, been met. Um, Nepal is now a federal, secular, democratic republic, and it's not a unitary Hindu kingdom. Um, on the other, however, as I've said, the same frustrations are, to a large extent, still there for many marginal groups and, and Dalits, and for women in general. Um, but these groups seem to be working um, through other means, other than violent re revolution, by and large, to, to improve these conditions. Um, my own current research in retirement um, is on, on the writing of Dalits. Of, of those who have been historically subjugated to the lowest levels of the, the Hindu caste system, but are now beginning to find, find a voice. 
So let me just very quickly say a little bit about, about the Dalits. Um, after an ethnic group called the Tarus, the Dalits were the second most heavily represented community among those killed during the, the so-called People's War. So clearly there was a widespread perception among the Dalits that violent revolution was a path that would lead to their, to their liberation. During this year, last past year, 2022, I, I, I met and interviewed more than 30 people from Dalit backgrounds who have become published writers. Um, the majority of these people are in their 30s and 40s, and the majority of them are the children of illiterate parents. So they are the first generation of Dalits um, to emerge as literary uh, creatives. Um, they were not allowed to study in Nepali schools until 1951. That's part of the cause. And even after that, I mean, one particular writer told me how she spent the first three years of her education standing up at the back of the classroom because as a Dalit, she wasn't allowed to sit. Um, so this rise to not only Dalit literacy, but also Dalit literary productivity um, is something that's happened only since the time of the conflict of the People's War and is perhaps a reflection of the changed times that Nepal now lives in. Um, so I, th I suppose that doesn't constitute a question so much as an observation, but I'm sure it's, these are thoughts that Shejendra will have some reflections on too. So with that, I will, um, as they say in Nepali, lay down my pen, but I'll lay down my <laughs> microphone. <to laughs> uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mark. That's a wonderful um, uh, evocation of uh, the, um, the landscape of uh, literature that the book is, uh, is contributing and, and posing some really interesting questions uh, uh, about uh, different forms of education and where education takes place. And so that's an excellent segue to hear from Professor Mario Novelli, who's um, professor in the political economy of education at the University of Sussex, and um, has, like Tajendra, really uh, sculpted this whole area of working on education and conflict. And Mario, I've been clearing out my office at IOE, which is... Throwing me away. <laughs> thro well, no, uh, identifying layers, strata of a work over 20, 30 years. And I came across uh, an old issue of ID21 Insights uh -huh. that I edited when you were probably an MA student and you wrote this riveting piece on education and conflict. And it's so <laughs> wonderful, like to gender, to have you on this platform to hear about how Trajendra's book con contributes to this field of scholarship you've helped shape. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And, you know, it's, um, it's a really great honour uh, to be here tonight. Uh, um, I confess a conflict of interest. Apart from being uh, an academic colleague, uh, Tijendra is also a personal and very close friend. Uh, so um, perhaps my comments might be even more critical, as <laughs> you, we tend uh, to be hardest with those closest to us. <laughs> um, so it's a great honour, and I really enjoyed the book. And I think that the um, the book as a, as, a, as a process of production also kind of, um, in a sense, is, is part personal and part intellectual. And the personal really comes out through the book, I think. And, you know, having spent the last uh, maybe 14 years uh, talking with Tijendra, I knew many of the stories in the book. And one can feel uh, in the book um, a real sense of humanity and also puzzlement, you know, puzzlement about the capacity of humans to create violence, the challenges that we have, the way that conflict is reproduced and inequalities are reproduced in and through education. And, uh, um, you know, it, it, I think the book does two things and it does them really well. And the first one, I think, has already been well illustrated that it's an engagement with a particular context a particular country and a particular history through the prism of education and trying to understand that but it's also I think tells a very nice story of a journey that many of us have been on over the last 14 years some more um, essentially um, debunking myths 
uh, that more education is good, pour more education and everything will be fine. Um, I think we've started challenging uh, questions of the kind of binary nature as well of the field. I think when we started it was all about the two faces of education. Education can be good and education can be bad. And I think that over the years we've started to understand the immense contradictions and complexity of the relationship uh, of education. And I think that is very clear in the book, the different dimensions, the way that education intersects with conflict in a whole range uh, of ways. Um, and I think that's, that's a really uh, a great uh, contribution, I think, uh, to the debate. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the kind of challenges that the Nepal story tells us is also challenges that are reflected across the world in many different uh, contexts. And um, in a sense, there is something binary about the framework, the victim, perpetrator, liberator, peace builder. In a sense, we've got two positives, the liberator and the peace builder. And we've got kind of two negatives, the victim and the perpetrator. Now. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of starting to think now that um, over the last decade, we've done a good job at understanding the multiple roles that education can play and understanding that conflicts don't begin and end within the geographical borders of countries, that there is an issue of geopolitics, international affairs, those kind of things that's important to understand. Um, but I think we still faced, and I think the book leaves us with this, is a kind of conundrum um, of the question of agency. Who are the agents that transform uh, this reality? In a sense, if we ask everybody, should we make education systems less unequal? Majority of people are going to say yes. Yeah. Should we make education systems more transformative? Majority of people put their hands up and say yeah. And we could go on with those. And yeah, education keeps doing the opposite. So what is it about the agency of all the actors that we are implicated in? And we are also those actors. No? We are, as researchers, embedded in a whole range of complex relationships with international development actors, agencies, nation states, NGOs. And so um, there's something there around, I think, um, uh, in a sense, a story of progress, but also a story of failure. We know some of the problems, but we haven't found very good solutions to those problems. And, you know, in a sense, if you look at like Sri Lanka, take Sri Lanka, <coughs> the solution to the conflict was a military one. We knew that that was going to end badly in terms of social inequality. But there are many conflicts where the victims of inequality rose up and took power yet didn't transform those social relations, no? We can talk about South Africa, but we can talk about Nepal too. So why is it that education systems are stubbornly unchangeable? Why do they keep reproducing? And what is the role of all these different actors in that process? You know, think about, um, we work a lot with this international dimension, which, which I think in the book could have been more pronounced and understand a little bit more of that. But for example, one thinks of the United Nations as an honest broker. Uh, people nod, but uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> the United Nations only exists in a country under the benevolence of that nation state. So that inevitably leads for them to be silent about some issues, to decide their priorities, to keep quiet when injustices are happening. Similarly, NGOs are often caught up in complex relations around financing and, and, and resourcing, which often pushes them in certain directions to keep quiet, not to push things. And so we could go on with a whole range of different actors, which I think then prevent that social transformation. So I guess, you know, going back, I, I will ask you this question is, um, you know, you, there, there has been a Maoist revolution in Nepal, uh, probably not that pure as people aspired to in the early phase. But, 
you know, when we visited the Terai region, when we talked with people uh, a few years ago, it was clear there was a sense of dignity amongst a marginalized caste that probably didn't exist before. A sense of things have changed, but they've not changed enough to really address those inequalities. And so I guess the question is, is how can we ensure that, I don't know, you've done two decades of work now, we've got probably another two decades before we put our feet up and uh, retire, or carry on working in retirement. Um, but the question is, is, where is it best to put your agency? And, okay, I'll say a simple one, which it says, forget about working with these big international organizations and work with social movements. But social movements have been prone to do exactly the same as the other organizations, yeah? Aspire for revolutionary transformation, then get into power and say, oh, this is very nice. I think we'll just keep things just as the same, but we'll just change the, the black hand of oppression, the white hand of oppression replaced by the black hand of oppression, uh, marginal caste doing. Mamdani's uh, recent work, Neither Settlers Nor Natives, he talks about this kind of con conundrum and argues for this kind of post-national state um, because he reflects on lots of conflicts and argues that the victims end up becoming the perpetrators and we get into these cycles of revenge and reproduction of those things. So I guess kind of at the, in the last chapter, where you lay out the positive and the negatives, who are the agents that you would argue would be best place to build that transformation? Where does academia sit within that um, in order for us, not only ourselves, but also to encourage our students to put their energies into processes that hopefully push forward some of those more egalitarian uh, ideas. Um, so I think, yeah, that's where I came at the end of your book because I think that I felt the humanity of the process. You know, I felt that, you know, you see the good in people and you can feel that inside the book's pages. But my question is, how do we address the issue of agency but also the issue of power? No, power to transform things, um, which hopefully is the next stage of research that we can collaborate on. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mario. That was <laughs> wonderfully provocative, as I hoped it would be. And now, last but not least, um, uh, we're going to pass the microphone to his. <laughs> His Excellency Gayan Chandra Acharya, who's the Nepali ambassador to the United Kingdom since January 2021, and a former United Nations Under Secretary General and High Representative for the least developed countries. We're really honored to have you here and hear your thoughts on the book of our colleague. Um, so over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Professor Elin Unterhalter, Professor Tejendra Farrelly, the board director, distinguished panelists, members of the academia, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, I heard a lot about the book. I'm frankly speaking that I have not read the book you know, in total. I've, I've gone through that a little bit. Uh, but I, it was very enriching that uh, those who have gone through it uh, from uh, you know, the cover to cover had explained it in detail. I think. Uh, it's very important for us, of course, to look at the history, but again, we have to look more about the future rather than only about the history. But of course, history teaches us how to look beyond the present. Uh, I think there are many things that you can really talk about in terms of the history of conflict. You are focusing more on the education and the conflict. That's why the dimension of the education and conflict got uh, more, uh, uh, you know, the highlights. Uh, in the particular, because that was the whole, you know, the framework in which we have tried to analyze it. But of course, there are various reasons for any conflict, and even for the conflict of Nepal, there were various reasons. So we still have, I think, it is still too early to really look at the history, and then uh, I think. Uh, but but the important thing about uh, about the book is that I think you have really looked at uh, this uh, this intersection of conflict, education, and peace in Nepal, which is very important for us.
Uh, I think it has made a very good attempt to analyze in a holistic manner, I must say, different dimensions of the interrelationship between peace building, role of education, and especially, I should say, uh, promoting peace, equity, and inclusive development. And this is what I think we should be uh, probably looking at uh, going forward. Uh, I have particularly uh, looked at the final suggestion as well, uh, which, is, uh, which has about six or seven suggestions that he has made, because they are related to the policy recommendations. And uh, from the inclusive historical narrative to the empowering of the local government, uh, to the investment more in community schools, as well as public universities and regulating private education institutions, to the global uh, citizenship education, which is the SDG 4, which is coming from the UN. This is what we also highlighted. Uh, I think uh, it is very important for, uh, for us uh, to really look at, uh, you know, the how uh, we have uh, moved from the conflict to the post-conflict phase today how the 2015, you know, the Constitution of Nepal has tried to capture many of the aspirations of the people and uh, how, you know, of course there are two commissions, one on the investigation of disappeared persons and another on the truth and reconciliation, that is still the work in progress. But how we have now created, through the constitutional framework, a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious, multicultural characteristics of Nepal. I think this is a very big change. We have to really uh, understand that. And then, of course, like every change, it takes time to really get reflected in the day-to-day -day life, as well as in the, in the actual, you know, the, the work of, the, of the every institutions, including the educational institutions. But the fact that I think the federal, democratic, republic nature, you know, republican feature of Nepal, is clearly enshrined in the constitution and which is precisely to take care of some of the issues related to marginalization as well as positive discrimination for political and administrative participation, empowerment of all the ethnic groups but especially for the marginalized communities as well as women. I think those are some of the fundamental changes that we have seen in the constitution. I think that is something that we, we are really uh, looking at it very positively. And then again, when you look at the uh, human development and economic progress, as well as political empowerment, we see that they are mutually reinforcing. Uh, that's why I think going forward, I'm, I believe that they are both the agents of uh, uh, progress, but also beneficiaries of progress. So I think this human development agenda uh, is very important for countries like ours. Uh, I think Nepal has also made a commitment uh, to fulfilling the uh, right to education of uh, its people. Uh, various policy measures have been taken. I was looking at the human development in the last 20 years, even during the time of the conflict or immediately after the conflict. If you look at the overall regional perspective, we are not doing that bad in terms of the education, net enrollment if you look at that natural uh, enrollment not only in primary education but in secondary education, uh, the gender uh, parity index, if you look at all of that, I think we have made a progress. Uh, it, is, it has not happened by itself. There were conscious policy decisions and there were a number of initiatives that were taken. And that's why I think going forward, of course, I mean, there are huge challenges again in terms of the education at the secondary level, at the tertiary level, even between the different gender. And then, of course, we have a challenge of inter-provincial parity and, the, again, the inter-ethnic, uh, you know, the community parity. That is still a big challenge. But we believe that, uh, I think, while looking at all of that, uh, I think the um, many initiatives that have been taken, especially in regard to, um, you know, the providing support for going into the schools, especially for the ethnic communities. Of course, you are talking about some of the issues where, you know, where you are sending your education, you know, your, your, your children. Uh, that is, there are other issues that has to be really dealt with. But the fact that in the last decade or so, we have made quite good progress in those areas shows that we are moving to the right direction. I think that is something that uh, we, we, we are looking at as a, maybe a byproduct of the, uh, the post-conflict uh, change that is taking place in the country.
And uh, we know that uh, when we agree that the people at the center of peace and development, that is what the whole the constitutional framework is trying to focus on. Uh, educational pro policies and programs are critical. Uh, I think learning in mother tongues, which is happening, although there are many in teaching problems and other challenges, and then how far you are really going to develop the curriculum as well as the books and making it available at every level, and then you know providing you know the training to the teachers. But I think uh, developing this curriculum in line with the new constitutions, uh, promoting peace, human rights, and civic education, respecting cultural identity with dignity, enhancing access to education by all especially demarginalized communities and girls with promotional and supportive arrangements. I think strengthening educational establishment in the remote areas, enhancing teachers' training programs, upgrading quality teachers and curriculum, promoting balanced education with focus on both the social as well as the technical side, and all of that, I think these are some of the priorities, uh, important priorities of the country at the moment. And I know that uh, it is a work in progress. We cannot just say that, well, we have done, and then we just sit back and look at the result. But the fact that all these issues that we have talked about and certain policy decisions have been taken and we are implementing that of course in a phase wise manner because you have to have the capacity to really bring about the changes that we are talking about in the educational sector i think the direction is is very very important the direction that we are taking is very positive uh, but it takes time it is work in progress but i'm sure that we have come this far thanks to the participation and support of all the stakeholders. It's not only the government, it's the government, it's the community leaders, the teachers, the MN, and the international community, I must say. And we hope that going forward, uh, we will be uh, able to make further progress and perhaps also take care of the main issues that come around in terms of the implementation, all the issues that we are talking about. Uh, but uh, this uh, dialogue and this, uh, I think the uh, the book, uh, we will have. Um, I will definitely read it, you know, uh, cover to cover in due course of time. I will show you uh, the way that you have explained, uh, uh, and then uh, we. I think that would be very, very important for all of us. I think this is a, this is a very important time uh, as we are coming forward. This is the, you know, the seventh year, eighth year after the promulgation of the Constitution and and this type of the debate and this type of a dialogue while looking at the global experiences as well as the you know the uh, in-depth analysis of the situation of the country I think looking at both sides the national perspective as well as the international experiences would be very important so for I'd like to thank you very much uh, our aim is definitely to promote a peaceful just and of course a, a society which can also, you know, take everybody forward uh, in terms of uh, ensuring prosperity and development in the country. And this type of debate is very, very important. So thank you very much for inviting us, uh, inviting me, and uh, taking part in the program. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, Tajendra, you've got four big questions to address, um, but before you answer the points raised by the speakers. And my thanks to all of all four, all speakers. Um, can I invite members of the audience to pose a few questions to, to Gendra? Uh, we've got a number of paths you might want to come down through your own perspectives. You might not have read the book, but it might have ignited interesting ideas for you. So. Yes, please start us off. Thank you, Professor. It's always good to hear about uh, all this research you have done. But just uh, in, out of curiosity, what were the practical challenges you faced? Is it working now? Yeah. Thanks. Congratulations, Professor Fradi. And uh, it's just uh, out of curiosity. Uh, General questions: What were the practical challenges you faced while conducting your research in Nepal, particularly these cross-cutting themes and uh, based your work based on the most serious uh, issue in the society, post-conflict, which is looking 
uh, beyond the conflict and general settings of the social structure. Thanks. Let's take that question first. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much. So would you like me to answer that question and then take... Then we'll, to, okay. then we'll go to Jenny and, and over here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so primarily uh, the research was conducted um, after the, the ceasefire and after the peace agreement was, was signed. And obviously the Maoists were quite... Um, powerful and quite uh, dominant across the whole whole country at that time as you can imagine around 2007 and 8 but also a lot of ethnic uh, um, uprisings have begun in the in the south and there was also a massacre in um, uh, in Kapilbastu and the rights between the Hindus and uh, and, and and Muslims uh, or the Pahadi and 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 uh, uh, Madesi communities um, so um, those were some of the practical challenges around going around the country and asking questions about um, the effects of the recently kind of concluded armed rebellion one of the uh, ethical dilemmas around asking those questions or engaging in those kinds of conversations um, was about the risk of re-traumatization of the uh, educational stakeholders uh, while engaging in those conversations. But what made me really kind of, it was a very surprising experience that even people who had been detained by security forces or been forcefully taken away by Maoist and uh, so for, you know, accusing of colluding with the other party and being tortured and uh, kept away for quite some time, they were actually telling their stories in a kind of amusing way. Um, I think it's a quite unique Nepalese characteristic where when you, even if you are telling a story of your pain, uh, you are telling it in, in jokingly and, and, you know, making the listener feel that um, you are a strong person and, and you went through those uh, really painful moments, but you, you, it was nothing kind of impression. Um, I was quite confused about how to handle that, you know, from ethical point of view. Uh, you know, you can't patronize your participants and say that you've been kind of traumatized, have gone through this pain, uh, so you need protection. Uh, you can't say, you can't be patronizing, but at the same time, there's that kind of tension hidden when those stories were, were uh, talked about. Um, but in, on many occasions, uh, coming across Maoist uh, uh, former rebels or, you know, activists who, whose morale was quite high and, and they thought that they had, con you know, captured the country and everything, asking these questions, um, and this repetitive narrative, uh, the way that Ma uh, Prachanda used to speak, every rebel uh, member would use exactly the same kind of narrative and language. Um, and sometimes maybe feel confused about whether this was real critical consciousness coming out of en engagement in politics uh, and this aspiration for social change, or was this what normally people would call that an indoctrination and memorization of that discourse and narrative and repeating that. Um, so these were some of the, not so much kind of uh, practical in terms of security challenges, but also, but more kind of how to handle the information that, that was coming out and how, how to make sense of the, the, the uh, narratives that were shared by, by the participants. That's completely fascinating, Tajendra. Thank you very much. Jenny. Um, thanks, Tajendra, and um, everybody for a very um, provocative and thoughtful discussion. Um, I have two quick questions, really. Um, one was that maybe you might predict, which is uh, gender, <laughs> um, which has kind of come across as a, as a theme in a little way um, across the different speakers. I just kind of wondered if you could develop how that comes into the book. 
I'm not thinking about women and girls. I'm thinking about gender relations, questions about masculinity. Mm -hmm. see, there, seem, there seems to be sort of rippling there under the surface. I wanted you to say a little bit more about that. And then my second question, which is completely unrelated to that, was back to your framework, um, the FPLP framework, which um, I was just thinking, as a number of the speakers were responding to the book about whether you see that as being specific to formal education or whether you also see that framework as resonating in the other kind of informal or different spaces for education that you, um, you both touched on. Yeah, okay. Do, do you want to respond? Um, so I think um, my book doesn't specifically or comprehensively look into gender um, issues or, or doesn't necessarily employ gender um, framework to look at the, the, the problem, but across uh, various chapters. Um, I think um, uh, the issue of um, um, inequalities across various um, uh, social categories, including gender, uh, was one of the most prominent uh, uh, sort of uh, foundational idea of socialist uh, struggle. Um, so Maoists were always talking about um, ethnic caste-based and gender um, uh, equity and uh, empowerment and women's participation in uh, politics uh, and uh, addressing some of the exploitative uh, social uh, practices where women uh, were repressed and their agency was uh, repressed. Um, and that was a form of uh, sort of injustice and grievance through which had to be kind of uh, transformed and, and, and addressed by a new socialist uh, kind of state which was imagined as part of the Maoist struggle. Um, so a lot of uh, examples and, 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 and narratives that participants were sharing and, and particularly the, uh, the narrative writing that uh, young female students were, were sharing, they, they were actually connecting with the uh, women's emancipation in Nepali society and being able to access all those opportunities at the same level as, um, uh, as men. Um, so it, it did. That was very aspirational and very powerful idea of um, uh, which actually justified Maoist rebellion. And many women uh, and, and young women, particularly, actually became part of that. And and the, the cultural troupe and then progressive songs uh, also reflected gender equality, uh, which were quite quite powerful. Um, but what has happened afterwards, I think uh, in, the, on the, in the Constitution there was like 33% um, reservation for women in, in political uh, positions and all the older positions. And I think um, political parties are not abiding by that, that kind of uh, commitment and, uh, and even the Maoist party is not abiding by that commitment. So. Uh, this is a problem of like when conflict ends and things begin to change. I think Maria was trying to point out how um, the uh, activists who were committed to social justice and when political change takes place and they go, go into power, then they begin to be co-opted in the broader uh, structure uh, where the fundamental agenda of social transformation are forgotten and uh, basic, basically the system becomes corrupt. Um, so I think th I would say that much in terms of what I can address and there are obviously kind of tensions around how to, how to address those issues. And your question about how that framework might be applicable in other educational um, domains um, I would argue that uh, it is a broad kind of analytical framework. It's a perspective which can be uh, looked into to dissect different ways that learning, thinking, discourse, positioning uh, are formed in society. Uh, and uh, it should provide that, that sort of tool uh, for policymakers um, or practitioners 
to be able to uh, be vigilant, to, to be able to be conscious about how education is contributing to uh, those multi-directional uh, dimensions. So one of the things that I've done in, in some other writings is how do we move from, how do we transform education from being victim and perpetrator to liberator and peace builder. Uh, it's a kind of an orientation, recognizing that education can face those potential risks and can become victim, but also recognizing that education could be manipulated in order to perpetuate those grievances. Then how do we address those? And how do we, um, uh, as policymakers, practitioners, teachers, learners, uh, achieve those aspirations of change and social transformation in the form of libera liberation and how do we achieve that peace with justice when we know that injustices fuel uh, you know conflict and there's a lot of evidence around that inequalities in education can fuel violent conflict so how do we push our practices and policies towards uh, more um, liberation and peace building so i would think uh, that that might be useful but obviously uh, I guess it's, it's a work in progress. I'm sure there'll be a lot of critique coming from different uh, directions, <laughs> which would help us think, think better. So we've got two more questions coming, but before we take those, we have to say goodbye yeah. to his excellency. Thank you very much. I have some other engagements, so thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you I'm very sorry much that I have to leave a little you. bit early. For your contribution. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Very, thank you. Oh, good. very nice. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, in the spirit of uh, asking, uh, or trying to draw general conclusions from a particular case, the, the, the recent history of, uh, of Nepal, I'd like to ask you a philosophical question about um, education and conflict. Um, we know that in, in uh, political science and political philosophy, um, there is a heated debate about just war theory. And there are two sides to the debate. Those who think that war is generally always a moral catastrophe and must be avoided. And the other side who argue that in certain circumstances, when faced with a particular moral evil of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, war and therefore conflict is morally justified and therefore that which uh, moral agents should uh, do, engage in. Um, but what we perceive as evil uh, or a, a immoral set of circumstances is a function of our political ideology often, of our religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, and so on. And uh, people subscribing to different ideologies will disagree over what is evil. Um, given that, um, do you think that there is a space for education that isn't allows it to remain neutral such that it can not take sides in a war, let's say, or a conflict. Mm. Um, or if not, and a lot of people I think will say it's not possible, uh, education will have to take sides. If not, is it then not in principle impossible for education to contribute to uh, conflict resolution? Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, that's a great question. I'm, I'm sure um, I, I, I should not be held hostage to that uh, amazing question. I'm sure the, the panelists here are, are well equipped to respond to that as well. Um, this is a fundamental question, right? And, and people normally who think about education as a technical process, uh, literacy, numeracy, serving to um, you know, provide certain types of skills and knowledge to be utilized in the economic market, you know, and that's why, you know, you, we have to keep education away from politics. It is a very naive and uh, ignorant uh, thought, I think we often hear in places. But education is inherently political. And um, that actually takes us to the question, the, the fundamental question of what we mean by education. And often when we are debating about what education should do and what it should lead to, uh, that philosophical question about what education is, is, is often forgotten. Um, so I, I suppose um, 
I, I would argue that it is not possible for education to be absolutely neutral. It has to take, or it has to promote certain kinds of ideas. By promoting certain kinds of ideas, it might be taking a side, right? But the main question, I suppose, is that what, what kind of ideas that education should be promoting? I don't think we should be apologetic when we are promoting the role of education in addressing injustices, inequalities, discriminations. Um, I think education should be geared towards that. But many, some people might actually argue that if you are promoting critical consciousness and enabling learners to be able to challenge some of the unequal power structures, are you not promoting instabilities and, and potentially violence? But that's the, that's the take, I, I suppose, that is it not violence to be continuously repressed and exploited by the structure which is fundamentally, you know, bad, yeah? If you are a member of that benefiting structure, probably yes, you would take the side of education should pacify learners and should help them get on with business and get jobs and succeed in their lives, not challenge and not question the power structures. But if you are at the grassroots and constantly facing those challenges, then it becomes necessary for your education to equip you to be able to challenge and, and change the conditions that you are living in. So there's going to be lots of discussion and debate about that theme. Diana. Thank you. Well, actually, that's really what my question was going to be about, because it's been such a fascinating session. You began with um, a very uncomfortable idea for me, which then Mario ended with, the idea that ed education is something other than a force for good. It can be complicit even in times of conflict. And as uh, Mario was pointing out, there are ways in which it's working against the, the very ideals mm -hmm. that we all share for being transformational, for uh, encouraging critical thinking and independence of thought and all those. That's what we're all aiming for. But there's this fundamental paradox within all of that, which is just as you said, it's an organ of the nation state. It's driven by politics, and so it, it, it does take sides, just because of that. So when you ask this very interesting question, Mario, of, so whose agency do you want to see? The only way I could have been able to see to resolve this paradox is not to regard agency as being the key thing. The, the, the teacher has to take responsibility, and just as you said, Jandio, we're, we're, not, we're not really promoting ideas. What we're doing is enabling people to understand ideas, to have respect for other people's ideas, and to be able to challenge them and to have those kinds of skills. So therefore, the teacher's agency is all about enabling and facilitation of the understanding by the learners. And the big problem is that teachers have almost no agency in our political systems, in yeah. our education systems. So if we can try to champion the teacher, trust yeah. the teacher, enable the teachers to be the kinds of agents of understanding that we need them to be, then there might be a way out of the paradox, the kind of paradox that, that might be So do you think that, that we could work on, as educators, that kind of approach? Would that resolve some of these difficulties? that we find with the nature of education and this conflict. Thanks, Diana. And to Jendra, in responding to Diana, I wonder if you could pack in some reflections on the questions mm. posed by Mario, the um, complexities that Uma identified, and some of the wider issues about literature and social artifacts and um, international Dynamics. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just in five minutes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So I, I think um, 
that's an ongoing tension, isn't it, Diana? I think uh, we have discussed about these issues uh, on a number of occasions and trying to uh, make a positive contribution in the context where things look completely impossible and uh, you know really difficult to move. So how do we enable that change is, is a very important question which I think Maria's question also um, you know specifically uh, points to, to that direction. Um, one of the problems of critical scholarship, which I think I am also complicit in that, is that we're very good at pointing out problems uh, and critiquing uh, and po you know, telling what is not working and what is not correct, and then concluding right there, rather than pointing out what needs to happen, how to enable that change. Um, so, uh, when I was um, in my kind of uh, uh, 30s, uh, early 30s, uh, I would be very, very excited about talking about these ideas and critiquing and, and, and challenging the audience and the panelists uh, in conferences. But now I'm, I really hesitate to ask those questions um, because I, I know that uh, making things happen uh, is is difficult given all the the the, the circumstances and, and challenges. Um, so, you know, in terms of like Mario's question about, I guess your question is coming from uh, the research project that we were involved in uh, in social movement learning, where uh, you know we kind of saw that. Uh, uh, non-governmental organizations or state institutions were complicit in geopolitical uh, uh, you know um, framework and therefore it wasn't possible to work in favor of the most marginalized um, grassroots communities because these institutions can't function unless they actually you know hobnob with the power uh, institution at the center. So we need to look for opportunities within the social movements which have the power to transform these uh, exploitative structures. Then we began to see a lot of um, co-optation happening in that process and uh, the leaders and activists of those social movements including in Nepal in Madhesh movements what we saw was uh, the leadership becoming completely corrupt and uh, um, people elect those um, um, you know leaders of their communities and when they go to power and there's huge amount of corruption going on and you know delivering that service is is no longer a priority and and this is what you said is like now you know black hand oppressing <laughs> <laughs> you know, black people, uh, you know, it used to be white hand oppressing uh, black people. So what's the difference, right? So um, I think that is a real kind of issue. So where do we find the hope? I begin to think that I think the hope is not in the big picture. I think in small practices, small initiatives, that's where you see some real change. When you go to local communities and you see um, small organizations making a real change with their, you know, real commitment, um, then that, that's where you get inspired. Then we talk about scaling that up, right? And then lots of things begin to go wrong when things are scaled up um, because power gets involved in that, in that process. Um, so I think it's an ongoing question as much as it is for you and for, for me probably is that uh, is, is how do we enable that change and how do we protect and preserve uh, the change of those movements that has been generated and capitalize on that in order to transform those institutions or strengthen those institutions to serve the interests of the people uh, you know who who actually propped up those institutions. So I don't think I've got a clear answer to that, um, but I would think uh, we need to be thinking along those those lines. Um, and going back to I think um, uh, Umaji's question uh, around um, you know how the, those redistributive 
policies around supporting the most marginalized through educational scholarships uh, often get uh, uh, stolen by those who control uh, you know, power, whether it is at the center or at the local level. Um, one of the biggest problems of decentralization in, in Nepal uh, is that it doesn't serve the purpose that it is actually expected at the central level policy. This is because the local itself is hugely unequal. Uh, and because unequal power relationships are so embedded in the educational spaces, um, people who need scholarships don't even find out about the opportunities that actually exist out there. Uh, and, and one of the, the other challenges is about this, um, this ability to negotiate rights and ability to articulate uh, and express those demands and having that confidence. I think when people have been suppressed for a very long period of time, their ability to express and argue and claim their rights is also diminished, I think. And, and that's why you see that uh, Tulo Manche in villages uh, is always Tulo Manche and is able to manipulate discourses and languages and then the people who actually need that support are deprived of those opportunities. And another problem is poverty, of course. I mean, there's, there, there's very little amount of resources in rural villages and everyone is competing against uh, each other to, to capture that. And the politicization of uh, educational funding uh, and its culture where school principals, school management committees, um, the firms that are involved in auditing those expenses, they have this symbiotic relationship. Um, and how do you break that? I don't know. <laughs> I think that's the dilemma. But I, I suppose that's the kind of you know, status quo that we are, we are, we are working against. Um, Mike's point, I, I, I think I, I totally accept your criticism about not drawing upon sufficiently on the fantastic literature um, outside the mainstream academia that, that in Nepali, that lots of brilliant stories are coming out uh, uh, from the formal, uh, former uh, rebels and, and other sort of type of literature that you pointed out. And I think that's a very valid point. And one of the uh, difficulties may have been around not interviewing um, the former rebels as part of my research. Um, which would have given me different kinds of narratives and stories about their motivation for joining the rebellion. Um, so I primarily focused on school-based kind of uh, narratives and in interviews. That was, that was probably the reason. Um, but also I think what you were talking about when educational attainment um, was uh, quite significant during 1990s, and uh, multi-party democracy was uh, restored, if you like, and uh, globally people were talking about uh, the end of the era and neoliberalism as the only option available. And suddenly um, Nepal presents this anomaly of uh, socialist revolution and surprising the world and actually com you know, capturing most of the power, around 80% of the whole territory was uh, reported to have been controlled by the Maoists by 2004. Um, and this is something reminded me of uh, Jeremy Rapalai's work on, um, on development. He talks about uh, the pretty much two phases of development and, and the, the idea that uh, conflict as development success, which I think relates to this idea of education as a liberator, that education providing critical consciousness, uh, you, know, a, you know, huge number of most marginalized young people being educated in the same system, being able to understand the structures that were excluding them and marginalizing them. And one of the interviews I remember with a, uh, a, a young person of a Taru community who had an undergraduate degree, but repeatedly he was trying to get a job as a teacher in the village but he wouldn't get it um, because he represented the most marginalized group and he didn't have that social capital to draw on to secure the position which would have been available. And people like him were, you know, very quickly 
you know, organizing against this kind of uh, um, narrative of uh, uh, exclusion and repression that the state was was pursuing. So I think that was what I was I was thinking when you were asking um, that that question. Um, yeah, so I suppose um, um, that's all I would have to say. I think uh, on broadly on on the comments from the from, from the panelists. Well, thanks so much to Gentra. Not only have you written a wonderful book, you've also spent a, more than two hours planning your next book and generating so many interesting and exciting ideas from it. So, um, I'd like you to. Uh, join me in um, giving a big round of applause to Tajendra. Thank, uh, thank you all to the three panelists and His Excellency who has left, if we can acknowledge that. And thanks to the generosity of Brad and our department. Please join us in uh, for a drink a meal and lots more conversations. So.